Great. So, um, all right. I see everybody coming in now. I want to welcome you. My name is Bill Rutledge. I'm the uh, project manager for NIPE Events. And uh, this is our first ever virtual events. Uh, we've done um, dozens and dozens of live events with uh, webcasting as part of the event, but this is the first time we've done uh, fully virtual for obvious reasons. So uh, welcome. We have uh, 200 people registered and I see uh, over 50 have uh, signed in so far. So I'm just gonna do a couple of uh, housekeeping announcements before we get started. Um, we're gonna try and make this interactive like our live events. So um, you're encouraged to ask questions at any time. And we have a couple of ways that you can do that. You can um, raise your hand. And uh, the way to raise your hand is you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, there should be a button there that says raise hand. We'll see that and uh, we'll um, uh, then unmute you so you can uh, speak directly to the panelists. And then uh, once you're done, we're gonna mute you again. Uh, you can also type a question if you'd like. Uh, and you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a button that says Q&A. Click that button, type your question, and uh, we will, uh, at an opportune time, we'll interrupt the panel and read your question to the panel. So uh, let's keep it interactive and um, let's keep it friendly. So uh, those are the ground rules. Uh, I do wanna let you know that uh, everything here is being recorded. So uh, be careful what you say. And uh, it will be archived to the uh, NIPEI uh, channel on YouTube. So you can uh, view it afterwards if you miss any part of the panel. Um, before we begin, uh, just to get a little feeling for the audience here, I've set up a quick poll. Uh, you should see this on your screen. We want to ask you um, if you've uh, previously attended a night pay event uh, and go ahead and uh, click um, one or the other. Just give it a couple seconds. So I can't vote? <laughs> no, sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just said I'm looking good because I'm not just wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> I guess they know me all too well. On the in-person events, I actually do wear a jacket. Okay. The t-shirt's still visible. Okay, might as well snug that up. <laughs> Okay, that's great. And uh, this is actually a, a huge number of uh, new attendees to the event. Normally it's, uh, I would say three quarters have uh, attended previously. It looks like 50-50 uh, here, so uh, that's great. We've got a, a lot of new, uh, new people joining us. So I'm gonna end it there. Okay. And um, We'd like to kick things off. I'm going to inter introduce uh, David True. He's the president of uh, NIPE. So David, take it away. Hey guys, listen, thanks for joining. Uh, Bill has taken away or covered most of the mechanical points. Uh, we pride ourselves in having very interactive events. So we'll see how well we manage that here. We are, as many of us have been since uh, March, learning as we go along through this new world. Uh, but uh, I'm more than delighted if you're in the New York area and we'll be in the New York area at some point when things get back to, you can hang out and have a drink and talk about something, please come and join the events since uh, we do this as a labor of love. There's a lot to talk about. It's fun. There's new topics. And for this particular one, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped us out, particularly the Columbia FinTech Bootcamp, who actually sort of were the ones to instigate a lot of this as we were looking for an event topic. And uh, I, I can't say I'm really, really delighted at the panel we've got tonight. And uh, the first stop, Jen Byrne, I'm absolutely ecstatic that she agreed to join. I'd known Jen, I think from a previous night pay event. Uh, as this was coming together, I was looking, I believe at LinkedIn or something and thought, wait, she'd be a great host. 
and it worked out. So um, I'm more than delighted. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, the topic, if I can remember, is something about what is it now? It's uh, uh, really the fintech topic and thinking, you know, now, uh, before, today, and afterwards and where it goes to. And I'm just going to kick it over to Jen and everyone else because they're much better equipped to talk about that than I am. So y'all have fun and please feel free to engage and question if you've got them. Thanks, David. And um, thanks again for inviting me to moderate. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Kesne, and we run uh, innovation projects in finance and insurance, including uh, programs like female founders in fintech and female founders in insurtech to really bridge the gap between large corporations and startups, and in particular to help uh, underrepresented uh, entrepreneurs, uh, women-led fintechs and um, insurtechs in particular. So I am delighted to be here and to host the very first uh, virtual event. We'll do our best to keep us on track. And um, as David said, we'd love your questions, so feel free to, to dive in. Um, we will be talking about, as David said, fintech after the lockdown. So we thought we would set the stage for kind of what life was like before COVID, now that we're in it, and what are, what do things look like going forward. And we'll try to cover a range of fintech topics from lending to savings to um, an investment in fintechs, as well as wealth tech, potentially reg tech and others. And um, I am thrilled to be um, joined by three amazing panelists who bring very interesting backgrounds and perspectives, uh, each unique. So this would be a really great conversation. And um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Camilla Garcia, who's the Vice Consul of FinTech and Professional Services at the Department for International Trade at the British Consulate. Uh, Julia Kim, who's um, the COO of the Burley Group, so we'll hear about uh, her company, as well as the Columbia FinTech Bootcamp Instructor, Head of Operations, AI, FinTech, and Startups. And um, our third panelist will be Ashley Paston, who is an investor at Bain Capital, who has been quite active <laughs> during this period of time. Um, I was doing some research on what you've all been uh, investing in even during COVID. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so to kick it off, um, when we think about kind of benchmarking where we were as COVID started to hit, we thought it would be interesting to kind of lay the foundation for what was happening in FinTech. Where was the innovation happening? What were banks thinking? Where were investors like uh, Bain getting involved? And you know, aside from living life and seeing humans face to face, um, what else was going on um, at that time? So I'd love to kick that off. Um, first question to Camilla to share a little a, a bit of your perspective on the landscape. Um, and we started to chat about that a little bit before. So I'll, I'll toss it over to you and we'll take the conversation from there. Yeah, absolutely, happy to. Uh, so Camilla here, as Jen mentioned, Vice Consul for FinTech and Professional Services with the UK government. Uh, well, and taking a look at where we were in a position um, in a pre-COVID world, right? Let's take a look at what the fintech landscape looked like regarding the funding, you know, availability of capital, uh, the growing verticals and where the attention was going to and the position of companies uh, in regards to market share pre-COVID. So we saw a lot of mega, mega rounds taking place, a lot of big acquisitions. We saw the maturity of some fintechs really diversifying what they um, were offering in regards to the product and um, providing more of a holistic uh, proposition to the customers. Um, with that maturity also came in the globalization piece as companies wanted to increase their customer base. And you know, the last part is the incumbents were really taking notice, right? They were trying to catch up digitally. So funding wise, quickly looking at it, um, I think in 2019, there were about 
59 uh, mega rounds globally. Uh, and we know a lot about the main ones, right? We think of the news, we see the Visa and Plaid billion dollar deal that took place or the acquisition that's taking place. We see uh, a Lending Club and Radius Bank, you see Credit Karma and Intuit. Um, and this is still continued even in early into COVID. And you saw the so that SoFi that acquired Galileo as of recent being one of the first day um, acquisitions that was done uh, fully virtually. So it's reset really the precedent of what, you know, the landscape looked like and what we should be seeing for 2020. Investors have funding, obviously Ashley will, will contribute to it in a minute, um, but you know, there's fintech specific funds, there's mainstream funds with the fintech element, and we're going to be seeing companies stay private for longer. We were expecting to see uh, companies get VC investment with high valuations and of course, large successful exits. Um, and then we talked about, you know, what else are, is the attention going to, right? And in my seat, I see mostly, I get engaged mostly with companies that do business internationally. Uh, so, of course, the first thing that came to my mind here is the amount of press releases and announcements that have come out of neobanks and challenger banks and anything with a wealth management piece that has really shaken up the financial service industry, right, and as a new entrant. So, on the challenger bank side, I'll, I'll take it easy. I'll say the four uh, European, the big European challenger banks, right? The, the Starling Bank, Monzo, Revolut, and 26 that have dominated in their home market. Um, and this is constantly what we're seeing, you know, how many more users, who can reach 100, is 100 million first? Or, you know, that's just the growth of the pattern that they're going to. And these companies are tying uh, their valuations to the growth of their customer base rather than tying the value, their uh, valuation to necessarily their earnings. Uh, so we're going to see how this is a challenge during COVID and we'll happily go through it um, through this discussion. Uh, but then another piece that I talked about earlier, I said globalization. You know, to continue growing this customer base, N26, Revolut and Monzo have gone over to states within a span of a few months. Um, to really just to build up that, that growth and, and continue what the success they've had in Europe in the, in the United States. Um, and then for wealth management, I read a piece on um, it with 11FS that wrote about the crisis coming at a time um, with a boom of retail investing. And I couldn't agree anymore. A lot of the, uh, you know, we, we've, we've heard this already, right? Financial services, the incumbents have not been really providing services for smaller SMEs, for consumers without large amount of funds. So we're, there's not a really an ability for us to grow our wealth. I, I say us, you know, SMEs and, and consumers to really be able to grow their wealth. And it's really offered the opportunity for neobanks to, to enter, to grow, to take on this market. And they do that by having low cost digital investment platforms. You have the likes of automated uh, building the portfolios like Nutmeg. You have the low cost or no cost brokerage platforms like Robinhood, Stash, Free Trade, even some with a, with a financial education element. And the last piece that I mentioned, incumbents are taking notice. So JP Morgan Chase, TD Ameritrade, they're now offering a similar service. And I, I, I thought about it and I use a neobank to manage one of my portfolios um, for, for stocks and whatever. And every single time that I have a transaction go from my JP Morgan Chase account to, to that uh, neobank, I get a notification like, by the way, we have an offering that has something exactly similar. So I think they're seeing a lot of these customer bases, you know, go elsewhere to manage their finances and, and incumbents are doing all they can to get that, those uh, customers back. Yeah, that's a lot. No, and I'm I'm sure your perspective coming from you know the the balance of companies leaving the UK or expanding into the US has been interesting. Um, and I don't know how much we can get into this, but there was a term that we covered um, in another conversation called the fintexit. Whether the Brexit would drive a fintexit. That's phenomenal. So, uh, <laughs> so um, you know there are different uh, points of view on that. Whether that has spurred more engagement or more expansion, but maybe we can come back to that. I, I would like to hear um, Ashley your perspective, sort of pre-COVID. What what was Bain focused on? What were you all looking at? What were the exciting opportunities and maybe some of the challenges? I think Ashley's on mute. Yeah, these pre-COVID are actually holding true post-COVID, so I, I can put them a little bit. But 
one of the big themes we were seeing um, and will continue to see is this idea of embedded fintech. And so really today, when you think about a fintech company, it's typically as you know, Camilla referenced, neobanks or a lot of these 1.0 fintech companies who have taken what incumbents have been doing and just doing it better, making it sleeker, making it easier to use. And, and we feel that there's a second wave of companies that are software companies that can add on financial technology elements in a way that better delights the end customer. So if you think about, you know, Toast of Toast or Lightspeed or any of these players, so Toast is, as many of us know, is a point of sale uh, payment, but also is the ERP for a small business or a small restaurant. And Toast knows everything about that company right they know that you sold four matcha lattes on monday and two on tuesday and so because they have such data rich elements about their end customer they're really well equipped to add payments in, into their offering and you know toast is a day one pay fact but companies like lightspeed have recently become you know payment facilitators and adding those capabilities in-house and we think that that trend will actually continue going into COVID and beyond COVID. And on top of that, beyond adding payments to your existing capabilities, we're seeing software companies becoming lending companies and software companies becoming investing companies or software companies becoming insurance companies. And, and the, the frame of reference of FinTech will no longer be the smaller circle, but over time will continue to expand as financial technology elements permeate into software companies. And that's something that you know, it was really evident uh, pre-COVID. We saw, uh, you know, Quip launch, which the toothbrush launching dental insurance as an example, and Tesla off offering car insurance. And that seems like something that will, you know, weather the storm of, of COVID. It's true. Yeah, there, I think someone came out with every every company is a fintech in one way, shape, or form. That was sort of the trend um, leading into that's, COVID. We should like, have a poster at Bank Adventures that says that at this point. <laughs> so, most days. <laughs> Yeah, and I think um, the other interesting thing, though, was overall funding was slowing down. So even pre-COVID, um, fintech investments were starting to decline. And obviously now in COVID, I think we've hit um, something like the 2017 lows, especially in that early stage. Um, but, um, but Julia, tell us um, what you were seeing. And from obviously from a financial planning standpoint, you have some insight into what, what sort of um, folks were looking for where there was some fintech opportunity obviously with your company uh, you saw that so we'd love to hear your perspective and um, jump right in yeah absolutely well I, you know I was actually going to comment on something that Ashley said she was talking about toast which was considered you know one of the fintech unicorns I think before, you know pre-covid and you know I was just thinking about them this week and I was like is toast toast right <laughs> because you know, they're in an industry that is sort of bringing together the, you know, sort of the restaurant food industry, right, and, and financial services. And, you know, obviously, you know, post COVID or, you know, uh, currently, you know, the restaurant industry isn't doing well. So I think one of the things that you're going to see a lot of, you know, going forward is a lot of these fintech unicorns that had these really high valuations are probably going to be valued much lower, you know, post COVID, right? Because things are changing, right? And, you know, even for small startups like my company, um, you know, there's a lot of things that you need to do in order to survive, right? And what used to be a short runway in terms of, okay, well, how much cash do we need? How much do we need in terms of operational, um, you know, uh, costs, you know, to survive, that, that, that runway has been lengthened exponentially with this whole entire pandemic, right? It used to be, hey, you know, maybe we could survive on like, three to six months, but now people are saying, no, you know, you need at least a year of cash reserves in order to, to you know, survive post pandemic, right? And so I think the thing that's gonna be most interesting for me is, you know, how these really big, you know, sort of FinTech unicorns survive. And I think um, there were a number that got funding recently. I, I wanna say um, I, Robinhood, right, I think got, um, like another $300 million from Sequoia earlier this month. But like, that's a great example where, you know, yes, it is an app that everyone is using. Um, I actually looked on my um, iPhone to see, you know, where it was sort of listed on the 
a number uh, of popularity, you know, popular uh, apps being downloaded. And it's number 52. So it's actually above Tinder and Target, right, in terms of popularity, which is kind of funny. But, you know, they had a lot of operational issues back in March when, you know, when people were trying to trade, trying to get into the market, especially, you know, during these volatile times, and, and they weren't because their app was down, right? And I think they actually had an outage this week, I want to say, also. And so, you know, even though they were able to get this money, even though they were able to, you know, get this really great valuation, you know, pre-COVID, is that going to continue? I'm not sure because of the fact that, you know, they're going forward, things like, you know, unit economics, you know, being lean, um, focusing on growth within your current customer base. Those are all things that, you know, startup companies are going to have to really focus on. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah, and I think pre-COVID, um, there wasn't so much thought about cutting costs and fortifying portfolio and cutting back marketing. You know, it was growth scale. And then it was, okay, let's now uh, hunker down, make sure that we were, we're spending the funding that we have since uh, I think two thirds of startup barely have six, six months runway or something like that um, from a FinTech standpoint. So um, definitely there was a different mindset. I think what was also interesting, a couple of financial analysts um, talked about the fact that entering this crisis, like where we were is so different from the 2008 crisis. So this is a health crisis causing an economic crisis. Um, banks were in better shape in terms of more well capitalized. And then also the fact that there was a little bit of caution leading into this. So there wasn't as much risk in the market as, as in uh, 2008. So I think as we shift the conversation into during COVID, I think that's also part of the drivers for why it's not a one size fits all description of fintech. It's very, there are, there are fintechs that are wildly popular that were not pre-COVID and some that are either becoming devalued or less interesting. Some of the wealth tech uh, unicorns, for example, now during COVID interest rates at zero, what else are they differentiating upon? So um, I would love to um, dive into the, the now, which is who's up, who's down, who's benefiting, who's struggling. And then also for any entrepreneurs that are participating, of course, hearing advice um, from a, a premier firm like Bain, is certainly helpful to hear, you know, where should we focus um, our, our existing funding and how do we approach that next round? So, um, Ashley, Camilla, who wants to take uh, the during I'm, I'm but contemporary. To, yeah, I'm happy to talk a little bit about the, the during. And what, what's been really interesting is that I would say it's crazy. First and foremost, it is so crazy that we are still under quarantine this long. And if you had asked me back in March, you would have thought it would be a, a one to two week stint. And now it feels like we won't be back until September, or maybe even the end of the year. And so at first, you could understand that in March or in April, deal pace really slowed, right? Because it, it's just unrealistic to continue the investment pace, even though you mentioned it had slowed a bit, but the same pace as the crisis before COVID hit, right? And, and so a lot of our efforts at that time uh, was spent spending time with teams we already knew, whether or not we backed the founder you know, historically, but if we had met them in person, right? Because it's just, it's hard to build a relationship over video, with especially the series A and C, because if you've never met the company in person and there are certain nuances you pick up in person, it's just really hard to get a deal done. And, and so the first two months, I would say, you know, very much focused on folks we already knew. It's, it's actually worth pointing out that we extended two term sheets during that time. One of which was a founder we didn't know. So there's always these exceptions to the rule. Um, but you know, that's why we saw, we've been seeing a lot of inside rounds, as you mentioned with, with Robin Hood, but also, you know, Brex and Carta announced today that we're both inside rounds. There's a lot of play to stability and, and looking onto your existing investors to help get you through this time. Now in May, I think people are really getting used to that. This is, this is the, steady state of sorts for the interim and 
And as a result, we've grown increasingly comfortable investing in companies that we haven't met in person, which I never thought we would have said a month or two ago. And again, you know, last week alone, we committed to two seed deals, um, one of which we'd never met before. So there's, again, um, this, it's, it's really crazy because this is not, you know, it's, you finally learn uh, what it's like to commit over video and you get used to that state of normal, but it, it really wasn't normal for a very long period of time. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the companies that are getting hit and who's benefiting, you know, you mentioned Toast and then I brought up Toast, but, you know, there are a handful of companies in very highly affected sectors, such as those targeting SMB restaurants or those targeting travel. And especially if they're payments companies, that are reliant on transaction volume. You're in a, in a short term sticky situation. Um, and so I think over time that they will revert back to normal. It's just for this short, in the short term, it's obviously a bridge that you, you need to gap. And that's why we've seen these inside rounds where you have the people that have been with you and know you for 10 years and have been on your cap table since you're a seed or series A who are helping you get through this time. I would also say lending companies are definitely, you know, I would say less well positioned than others, right? Because in a lockdown, obviously it impacts all people, but especially those in low income households. And it's, if they're unable to generate income, it's really difficult to imagine them meeting their payment obligations on existing loans. And so those companies, I, I think, will also go through you know, a little bit of a short-term rough patch, and, and we may even see some consolidation in the space as a result. So those are some things that we've been seeing here. Yeah, uh, Forbes published a, a shopping list um, for uh, firms like MasterCard, Visa, and PayPal, and some of those fall into that category of lending. So companies that might have lost a little bit of value but still have functional um, relevance, Cabbage, Common Bond, folks like that, even betterments mm -hmm. of the world is there an opportunity now um, because there's interest in those capabilities but it just might be opportunistic for an acquirer so um, that should be interesting I think some M&A activity you all mentioned um, prior looking like that's picking up I think it's great to hear that um, you are you've shifted to digital right so as uh, Satya Nadella uh, I think his quote was We've, um, we've packed two years of digital transformation into two months. And I think it's, you know, for a venture fund, for all of us. And I think that that's, that's great because, you know, if you look at, you know, two thirds of the firms not having enough capital to survive past September, yet they've been previously funded. I mean, I think that's, that's pretty telling. So it's great to hear that you all are active uh, uh, digitally. Um, that's, that's very, very good. Um, hey, Jen. Yeah. yeah uh, we've got some uh, questions from the audience already. Are you uh, interested in taking a question? Sure. Okay. Uh, so the first one is from uh, Dave Birch. I'm just going to read it. Uh, the virus seems to be accelerating digital strategies, of course, but what is the long-term impact of fintech on payments? Does it get absorbed through merger or acquisition to be more of the same, or do we see new scale plays around ACH, FedNow, or even cryptocurrencies? Also, what does it mean that the U.S. began mailing out stimulus checks in the same week that China's digital currency went into beta? Well, uh, if I may say one thing, Dave Birch says that at every event about checks in the U.S., so I'm getting tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who actually, wants to um, comment? So uh, it's funny. Actually, I, re I read this article today that um, said that the IRS was actually sending out EIPs uh, via debit cards now instead of paper checks, which I thought was really interesting uh, that even the IRS is sort of, you know, transforming their process, right? Um, and, you know, these, I think it was like $4 million worth of debit cards that they mailed out this week, and they have maybe like $10 million more to go. Um, but, you know, clearly, you know, times are changing if they're moving away from paper checks. <laughs> You know, and I think the banks that have been positioned digitally leading into COVID are now benefiting. So Ally Bank, the CMO, was, I think, quoted today saying, okay, now we're in the phase of emergence here. Let's get back to um, talking about product. We don't have to um, uh, 
talk about you know the past and the problems, but let's let's talk about solutions for our customers that are digital services. I thought that was re actually really telling. But from a, a payments and sort of um, I guess digital transformation, what what else are you all seeing now that we're kind of in the throes of this? Any other thoughts on payments? I know yeah. that. Um, um. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I, I mean, to add on to, to um, what we were just talking about, um, you know, there's been a, a huge uptick uh, on, you know, these small mom and pop, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, stores, physical stores, you know, transferring their business online just to survive, right? And so you've got companies like Shopify that are doing amazing business, right? They've been doing really well. I think they had a, a, a meeting last week where they were like, things, things are on the up. Um, and then you've got companies like Etsy, which isn't a fintech company, but they obviously have a platform for sellers and, and payments is a component of that. And they have been doing amazingly well. I mean, I forget what the stats were, but something like, you know, if you didn't count like masks, right? Because obviously there are a lot of masks that were sold through Etsy, homemade masks but it was something like 80% increase of revenue, you know, like sales, you know, since, since like the same time last year. And it was just, you know, all these new sellers that just got on to Etsy to try and make sure that they were able to sort of pivot their physical business, right? And sell to the consumer online, which I thought was really interesting. I have another um, audience question, if you're ready. Can I, can I add on to that, if that's okay? I, I went off mute. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, no, just adding on to Julia's point, you know, you have, you have the likes of Shopify that are offering these uh, e-commerce platforms and allowing for small businesses, mom and pops boutiques to sell their products. But what's also interesting on the payment side um, is the growth of payment processors right now. So uh, I'm not sure if anyone's seen this, but Marketa that's grown their traction significantly since COVID started, since, better, since the lockdown started, um, with their partnerships with food delivery services like Instacart and Grubhub. And you know, given the push that people have now to order their, their meals um, through these services, I mean, they're gonna continue to grow. So I think that would be a response in how, how the impact of COVID has on, on starting the payment side. Just one more, one more um, interesting tidbit to share. Um, I don't know if anyone caught this, but um, Bob Peck, who's the chairman of Global Internet Banking at Barclays, um, talked about how he's bullish on the COVID stocks. And what he meant by that was that it's C for collaboration, um, O for online commerce, V for video streaming, I for in-home services like telehealth, workout apps, and then D for delivery. And What's interesting is that it is kind of true, but what's also interesting is that fintech and payments and insure techs are actually at the core of all of those enablement, whether it's identity, cyber payments, processing, some of the enablement that you're talking about. So I think um, not to be too bullish, but that is sort of an interesting um, positive um, aspect of what's happening in the market, but it's all not, not all rosy. Um, but go ahead with the next question. Good thing. Uh, this is from uh, Chris D'Antono. Uh, will the challenger slash prepaid commercial model of freemium change? Okay, sorry. Will the commercial uh, challenger prepaid commercial model of freemium change given that most of these survive on interchange? If I can maybe add here, I mean, the first thing that I'm thinking about are the freemium offers that challenger banks have, right? With the core banking product, there's no fees. It's very transparent. You, you get all of these service offerings. And I wouldn't necessarily think they're gonna change um, just to serve the interchange. What you might see is these companies re-diversifying, going into diff getting revenues, getting streams from revenue from other sources. Um, and, and they started to do that, right? So um, they, they, I think, uh, is it Revolut that has a crypto exchange, um, the business side of core business banking side, I know Mons was getting into that on, on a, with, a bit, with a business banking, uh, with a license and, and whatever else may be. So I think they're actually going to be looking at getting the revenue streams on that end rather than having to charge on the freemium service. But that's just, that's my opinion. Yeah, hey, and I it. think, um, um, you know, just to add to that, I, I think it's a little early to really know what's gonna come out of this, right? 
um, you know, for at least for New York, you know, we're still sheltering in. We, we haven't been able to leave our homes yet. And so, you know, if you think maybe six months out, you know, it, I think there's going to be a lot of adjustments for businesses, right? And, you know, pre-COVID, you know, as a business, you were very much focused on your product or your service. But post-COVID, you also kind of need to think about health and wellness, right? Health and wellness of your employees, health and, health, uh, health and wellness for your uh, consumers. And so there's a lot of things that you have to think about. And there's going to be operational costs and sort of logistics and ground, you know, all of that, right? And so I think, you know, even though six months seems really far away, um, I think it's going to take another six 12 months before we even understand the implications of what's happening right now. And we can imagine what it is, but, you know, it's, um, I think it would be uh, premature to say, hey, we should, you know, drop this freemium model and go to subscription-based fees or something, because we, we just don't know. And I think we need to test the waters. And I think, you know, since we're doing sort of like these, uh, you know, um, like layered rollouts of different states and different services, it's really going to be hard to see, you know, how that impacts everything, you know, until, you know, probably next year, I would say. Yeah, and I think even leading into COVID, I don't know what, I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts, um, but we were seeing that insure techs were becoming fintechs and fintechs were becoming insure techs, meaning they have their customer base, they have their product and their capabilities and offerings, but they were all looking for other ways to meet the needs of that customer or, or drive lead gen. Um, so I don't know if you have any experience seeing some of those patterns accelerate during this, the last uh, several months and going forward. Yeah, on, on that, I would say, I guess back to the same thesis, it's how can you be the heart and lungs of your customer, right? Like how can you deliver every single thing that they need and so you are their sole provider and you could therefore better delight the customer have better cross sell better monetize and you name it so a great example here is we have a company um i'm not going to say the name but they they work a lot in, in claims communication so they're a chat bot for for if, if you have a claim they basically will be in the fnol process and they're looking to expand it to the claims payment process because if you think about payment disbursement at a claim a lot of that is printing a paper check and sending it to a person oh no you said paper check they was going to be I all said, over like, that again. the worst words ever <laughs> and since then. And I said, it's like <laughs> Um, and, but also if you think about it too, like nobody's going into the office, who's sending out these checks. So if you get in a car accident right now and you need to give money to a body shop, how are you paying for it? And so they're trying to expand, take over more of the value chain to encapsulate, uh, payment disbursement into their offering one, because it's better for, you know, the insurance companies have to ha somehow manage this claim payment process, especially given so much is paper check based today, but two, you're just better. It's a better sell to the insurance company who doesn't want to deal with 18 different providers. If you're just the one provider that provides everything that they need, then you really just put yourself in the best position to sell into them and, and stay with them. Any other questions popping up on the? Yeah, I do. I have uh, two that are related, so I'll read both. Okay. Uh, one from Magda Lowitz. Uh, overall, will COVID present more opportunities or challenges for fintech businesses? And one from Tay Revez. The economic crisis created by the health crisis is also creating political crises in multiple countries around the globe. These are likely to expand as the situation continues. How can this Im impact fintech and payments? A lot of good questions in one. That was a really good segue um, to the forward-looking part of the conversation. So, um, Julia, what, what, what say you? What do you think? The pros, cons, ups and downs of uh, fintech and beyond? Well, uh, I, I live in startup land. So, um, Albert, Albert Einstein had this really great, great quote that he said. Um, it was something like, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. So for me, you know, as much as there is, you know, a lot of loss during this time, I think there's a lot of opportunity because, you know, for a lot of startups out there, 
um, and, you know, and fintech companies, it's a time to look inwards, right? And really think about, you know, what your core business is, what are the drivers that drive revenue within your business, and what can you do to optimize those processes within your business to make sure that you're maximizing, you know, all the little bits that are happening, right? Because, you know, when you come out of this, you want to be sort of a, a, a leaner, faster, more efficient machine. And, um, and this is the perfect time, right? You know, things are probably not going as quickly as you would like, but it's a good time to kind of take that time to, you know, sort of fix the internals, right? And so I see a lot of infrastructure work, you know, and, and this applies, I think, even to large uh, financial institutions, right? You know, uh, if you think of some of the big banks, there's a lot of old, you know, <laughs> architecture that exists behind the services they provide. And so what, you know, better time to really think, you know, assess, like, what do we need to change in order to, you know, help us, you know, accelerate that digital transformation, make sure that we're ahead of the game next time when there's something happening in the future. So um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity now, uh, whether or not you take it, I think that's up to you, right? So, so we'll see. Well, definitely in financial planning and advice, I would suspect that a lot of um, consumers who hadn't really thought about it when you have a combination of health and financial crisis that they would look for expertise. So I, I, would, I would imagine that's a, a growing area coming out of this, um, just learning about how to use that loan, how to save, how to weather this financial storm. So um, I would suspect you would be seeing a, an increased amount of activity. Yeah, I think anything that has to do with financial education, because I you know a lot of um, individual consumers are probably worried about their loans, whether it be mortgages, you know, any sort of car, student loans, and they're probably thinking, okay, what do I do? How can I sort of fix this for myself? And they're probably trying to be more educated about what the options are, right? And so, um, yeah, financial education, debt management, right? You know, because, you know, banks will start seeing a really, you know, sort of frightening rise in loan losses coming up soon, right? And um, I think there was an article today about how uh, 4 million people have, you know, stopped paying their mortgages because of, you know, either unemployment or other, you know, other things outside of their control. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to add to that, Camilla. <laughs> you went off mute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a few times. Um, so I think, I mean, there's many points that you mentioned that I fully agree on. And I think, you know, if we look straight to the future, what what's, it's been really called for, I think, and, and it reflects um, something to what you said earlier um, on the downloading of, of Robinhood is, is this demand for um, a better customer experience and better ability to manage their finances. So that's definitely, you know, companies come taking this time right now to fix their internals, develop their products and ensure that they're able to offer this real um, full holistic product to their consumers with a superior customer experience, especially as right now in crises, it's very difficult for consumers to change financial providers. I think change usually, uh, crisis usually stops any change, but there are definitely going to be um, adjustments and, and considerations of changing from my incumbent uh, bank to a neo bank or another incumbent bank or whoever, whoever meets my, the basic needs that I have. So who might, you know, right now building that piece on what, what the service offering is, what makes you differentiate from your competitors is definitely the time um, that we need to be focusing on. And another point that was mentioned, I mean, you can't really think of the COVID lockdown, COVID crisis as a complete negative blanket that's gone over to everybody, right? We've talked about this before. Obviously, so in, during any time of market uh, shake, there's going to be, um, an, you know, an infraction, there's going to be opportunities in the market. So some of company techs are definitely going to be struggling. The lending side is, is one of them um, on, a, on all verticals, right? You have the peer-to-peer -peer lending, uh, volume's gone down, consumer loans. I heard something similar on the uh, mortgage payments, but also something like 10% um, of consumer loan payments have been late, twice the national average. Um, and then, I mean, we can't even get started on the SME lending side. You know, here are the furloughs, you think, here are the tightening of credit lines, the threat of a liquidity crisis. Um, and then I'll probably one more point to it is thinking of how we're gonna be assessing the risk profile moving forward. 
how are we going to be rebuilding credit moving forward? I think these is, you know, there's going to be a lot of focus on these two elements, especially as defaults start coming about, especially as SMEs start getting access to funding to move forward. So those are probably the main two that I'm looking at. But you know, on the plus side, we talked about it, the e-commerce prospering, payment processing prospering. So it's, it's a mixed bag, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, and uh, it's, it's so interesting. Um, I one you know, in, it, we were talking about, the, I think the second question was about health, right? Uh, with the whole pandemic, you know, I, I'm really curious if contact less payments will now finally really come to fruition in the U.S. I mean, if you think about contactless payments outside of the U.S., um, you've got countries like Australia, that's like 90% of the transactions are contactless. Like in South Korea, you know, 96%, you know, UK, Canada, like over 50%. And in the U.S., even though most of us have, you know, an NFC chip or, you know, some sort of uh, mobile device where we could do contactless payments, um, we don't, we tend not to, it's, it's less than 1% of total transactions. Um, and, you know, I did see some, you know, updates in the, in the news about various, um, you know, uh, retailers thinking about transitioning now to some sort of form of contactless payment. So like Kohl's is going to use something called Kohl's pay, um, you know, and, you know, there are other, you know, I think businesses that may not have, especially small businesses that may not have used you know, like Apple Pay or, you know, Google Pay or something like that, but now are probably thinking about those things because, you know, there's that sort of like, you know, health and safety, you know, uh, component that you now have to take into consideration. And, you know, and, um, and also like the cost, like there's going to be a huge cost, especially if you're a brick and mortar um, business, because, you know, if you think about, you know, the the amount of business that you can support it's going to change right because you or, or restaurants also because you can't have as many people in the physical space that you have right or not only that but you have to constantly clean that space so if you're a retailer like the you know like gap or you know uh, banana republic or something you know you have a certain amount of square footage that one you're not making as many sales on and then two you have to clean constantly and so there's this now, this just new world of cost, right? <laughs> it, you know, in order to maintain the safe environment and healthcare of like your consumers that you, you probably didn't even think of. So, you know, as Camilla was saying, you know, it's totally right. You do, the risk models that you had before to, have totally gone out the window, right? You need, now need to create these new models in order to assess, you know, what is the likelihood of this person defaulting or what's the likelihood of this retailer making it you know, to X number of, you know, millions of dollars next year, you know, all those models need to change. And that's big, you know, that's a big undertaking. And I think it's going to be sort of hard to hard to figure that out. And, and just to, to piggyback off of what Julia said, it's something that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about with respect to the contactless payments piece is, is this a trend that is completely taken off during COVID because of you know, people don't want to handle cash for hygienic reasons. Um, and then something that goes back post COVID. So, you know, I mean, you've seen the stats of like MasterCard said that contactless payments saw a 40% jump in quarter one. As you mentioned, Kohl's has been working towards uh, self checkout. So as Walmart launched Walmart Pay, so as opposed to, you know, hitting the pay now button on the screen, you can scan a QR code. And even we've seen international governments, as, again, as you mentioned, increasing the limits for things you can pay for with contactless payments of Canada increased from 200 to 250 as an example. But something, you know, I've been thinking a lot about is, I don't know if you guys go to Sweetgreen, I, I'm obsessed with Sweetgreen, my team makes fun of me quite often for it, but they tried to go completely cashless. And last year, Philadelphia and other city governments said, you can't do this because it's discrimination against underbanked customers. And so there's this question of, are governments being, you know, more amenable or pushing it more because it's COVID and you want to be as hygienic as possible? And is it something that lasts a year or two? And then, you know, once, and hopefully there's a vaccine and we get over this, is this a trend that reverts because you're unfairly discriminating against a certain subset of the population? And I, I it's just inter internal musings I've been 
Instagram. No, of course. And actually I was having this exact same conversation with somebody today. And the whole point is you're right. Like sweet green is a perfect example where they've tried to go contactless. They accept, they say it's like completely no cash. It's either card or the app, but mind you, if you think about it, they're encouraging um, the, their customers to be paying, you know, contactless paying on the, with that, with that QR code, BR code or QR code or however it works. Um, and they reward you by a loyalty program. So, but you know, it's also worth thinking of other markets. I know Philadelphia and I think New York have said that if you don't, if you don't accept cash, um, you're discriminating against, but you have to think of other economies and how they've done this. So I'm thinking of the likes of, uh, uh, is it uh, China with, with Alipay, how they're completely able to use it in almost any merchant. You know, it's, it's, it's the norm. Everyone has it ingrained in their phone and it's not necessarily seen as, as a discriminatory app. So I don't know necessarily what the implications are for other uh, big nations. Now, mind you, I wonder what this also looks like and the implications for big tech, right? So the fact that, you know, it's ingraining Apple Pay, Google Pay, and all these cards on our phone, you know, it's really makes it easy for a lot of these large players to really involve themselves in the, in the, in our financial lives um, by partnering with an issuing bank um, to, to, to process these payments. So it's contactless. I think it's a move to big, to big tech and, and, really it's something that we can see because we've seen it been successful in the past um even in new york so I, the last point i'm going to mention last and even in new york you know we've just finally gone from those silly metro cards to some stations that finally have a contactless i mean really well timed unfortunately um but that's something that has been happening over in the uk and london for so many different at least five years if not more and the other thing that's going to be interesting to see is as you decide which card you link to which wallet, how that sticks and that will cause a number of loyalty and other issues, right? Once you link one or two cards, you're not going to go back and unlink them. So with 70% projected to continue to use contactless, even, even though they were first time users, that's pretty, that's pretty compelling. There was an RTI research study that released that number, which I thought was interesting. Um, the other, the other um, area to think about is the, the segments of customers. So uh, PayPal uh, announced that the uh, silver tech movement of how their, their user base over 50 has skyrocketed basically in the month of March or April, I think it was. And so bringing on all those new digital customers has also turned out to be a very interesting challenge and opportunity, I think, for financial institutions, even the larger kind of unicorn, large fintechs, I guess, like PayPal. Um, but whether or not sort of the older segment, if they stick around with digital or do they prefer to go back into the uh, branch bank or do they prefer to go back to writing checks i don't know why i just said check i feel like this has turned into like a drinking game if we say check <laughs> dave birch has to have um a drink or something um so um but that'll be interesting to see like that stickiness by customer segment as well um because it's not all one story right yeah that's true and i think you know you made a really great point i think those companies that really focus on the end user experience, especially if they're, they're looking for new users, right? They're, they're, they're going to have to go through this onboarding process and the, the shorter and painless it is, the better, right? And it, and it, it applies to whether you're a millennial or someone who's in, you know, a, an older category. And um, it made me think of this um, insurance company called Lemonade, which is, you know, a, a pretty well known fintech unicorn, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the thing that sort of um, drove them to the forefront, right, uh, was that you could get insured in 90 seconds, right, and you could get your pro claim processed in three minutes. And so when you think about these, you know, th the unemployment insurance experience that many people are going through right now, you know, you want to experience more like a lemonade experience, right, where you're you're, you're either doing it on the phone or online, but it's a seamless, quick experience and you get sort of a result at the end versus people who have been calling the unemployment office you know, for weeks and still not sure if they're going to be eligible for unemployment. And so you know, I think the companies that really understand that that is you know, a big barrier or challenge for onboarding users, you know, they're the ones that are going to win in the end. 
Yeah, I have some more questions if you'd like. Okay. Okay, this is from uh, Jeffrey Schultz. Uh, to Ashley's point in her discussion around insure tech, the new business model is to be everything to everyone, i.e. all services under one roof. That's the platform tech model. Do you see others aside from the big ones like Google, Apple, Samsung, et cetera, really making an impact? Yeah, I mean, I feel that picking on, not picking on, but uh, Toast is a great example. So Toast is a software company for restaurants, has payments, but recently launched Toast Capital. Um, as it, Shopify has Shopify payments and is also expanding into lending and lending out to their end merchants. Um, Square uh, is a, obviously a payments company for SMBs and has Square Capital. And again, same exact thesis of the more data you have on the customer, the better you are at underwriting that customer, right? Um, and so, you know, we'll see, we'll continue to see software companies expanding and trying to be everything to everyone. Maybe not as verticalized as we see out east in, in that those players really have every single thing under, under their roofs, but companies are gonna try and get pretty close, as close as they can. Yeah, the, another um, example that comes to mind, a new neo bank um, showed up on the scene called Oxygen. I don't know if you've heard much about them. And, and the idea that they're setting up a challenger bank that suits two purposes. One is, um, you know, just personally as a consumer, but then they've also taken a look at more like a user profile where, and maybe you have, maybe you become a gig economy worker. And so what are your needs? And so they're adding services like click here to form an LLC. So it's kind of brilliant when you think about it. It's not just the banking part, but as gig economy shifts and all of these workers maybe that weren't in the digital economy are now gig economy workers, um, whether it's the chef now um, you know, cooking lessons from home via Zoom, chef has to accept payments may not have an LLC. And so all those different use cases coming out of the kind of new gig economy, I think will look very interesting as well and present opportunities for, for the payments um, industry and, and bundling of services. And, and this, is, this is David Drew. This goes to a point that someone raised online. This could result in significant political changes, things that were theoretical in the past such as, you know, we knew there were lots of people living paycheck to paycheck, had now become very real. We see bread lines, you know, people, food banks that are being overwhelmed. And we're also in an election year. So I'm wondering if that will cause at a political level, a policy level changes that will then be addressed, that will create opportunities or risks for some of the companies in the technology space. I mean, I think right now of, of what was going on in California and bringing suit against Uber. Uber's having a lot of problems right now anyway. But is this uh, highlighting the, the, uh, the risks of the gig economy to the greater society? Will that make problems for such companies? Well, certainly, obviously, the U.S. government needs to get a better handle on digital transformation. That, that, that's certainly one step, and that not every... American, let's say, has the same capabilities or knowledge or education, and even our government officials don't even probably know what some of the technologies are. But because of this crisis, it forced them to become more digitally savvy. So in that way, I would say it's a good thing. Um, but it was, um, oh, the other point is they, they had to move swiftly, and the government, I don't think, has ever moved this fast. Um, deploying the amount of uh, loans that they've done in a short period of time. So that's actually kind of a, a shock. Um, but there's a lot of um, concern, I think, in the U.S. that we're going to exacerbate that digital divide and that financial divide um, coming out of this crisis. And I think that's a real risk. I think that's something that's going to remain a topic. And, and as an investor or a, or a founder, do you think if you had been planning a model that depended on this, uh, you know, 1099 gig economy model, do you think that's less, uh, that makes it a more difficult model to build upon uh, post COVID? Do you, does that increase the risk of such a model? 
I don't know what the panel thinks. I think is what what sliver of gig economy are you talking about? Is it um, you know the well, well, the telehealth anything, professional that was only doing on-site home visits and now they're doing everything digitally? You know, so I guess I wonder. Well, I'm just thinking the notion that the people who had been the 10 and 99 economy with no benefits has been something we've talked about for a while. This has made the social risks of it very clear because you see so many people who are, you know, literally that can't have nothing to eat. We're in a political year. Does, does that increase the risk that those kinds of companies will be more difficult to build, that it will be more difficult to classify someone as a 1099, thus increasing the cost of bringing on such a business? Is that on anyone's radar screen? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I feel like there's actually more opportunities in the gig economy, right? For a lot of people, um, if they had multiple streams of revenue, multiple sources of income, they probably felt a little bit more secure in this situation than others, because maybe if they lost their primary source of income, they still had, you know, a secondary source of income to fall back on. And, you know, technology wise, you know, there's so many, op you know, so many offerings out there in order to start your business. Um, you know, it used to be that you had to buy like a server farm in order to like, you know, build an app and host your, you know, your, your application online and things like that. But now, you know, there are services through AWS, um, you know, just so many things that have changed technologically that um, you know, if you are a very small, you know, gig gig worker or <laughs> a tiny business, um, I think there are a lot of opportunities to fill a void. And you know, I also feel like a lot of the larger companies out there are probably not going to be hiring as aggressively as they were, you know, pre-COVID. And so they're probably going to take on more contract work to allow them that flexibility of, you know, um, you know bringing on people as they need it, right? Because, you know, it used to be you just hired and you had people on staff, but you, you know, there's a, there's a cost to that, right? You know, you have to pay for their benefits. There's a lot of, you know, other things that you have to consider. Um, but, you know, now if you're working with contractors, um, you don't have to pay for their benefits. There's a lot of things that you're sort of more flexible about, you know, in having someone who's that type of worker versus a full-time employee. So I don't know if that sort of addresses your question. <laughs> one, um, one example, David, um, that I, I can share is that even pre-COVID, the, a lot of, um, insure techs and insurance companies were actually looking at how do we cater to a gig economy worker to make sure their life health, financial well-being, and moment in time insurance based on that gig economy worker's profile was covered. So they may be an Uber driver, but they're an actor, but they're also um, an artist or, or something else. And so there were a number of insure techs that were actually trying to produce those products. And um, one of them is called Surround Insurance, and they told me because of the crisis, they have more opportunity because now there are more workers, let's say, that um, maybe they're riding a bicycle now to work. I mean, it's no, not, I'm not even making that up. It, it, there's no public transportation, essentially, that's safe right now in New York um, and um, or somewhat safe, but, um, but that moment in time, case specific insurance products, I think there are some, a lot of interesting entrepreneurs trying to solve for that kind of safety and security side of the gig economy worker. Um, but it's the insure techs doing that. I'm not hearing about that from government officials per se. Well, well, my, my point with some of others that you don't see a risk of, um, uh, policy making it more difficult to start a company using 1099s, thus saying you can't classify them as such because of the social realization that they've caused. So one was the opportunity that we can address those uh, lack of security that 1099s have. The other would be such as California just brought suit against Uber saying they have to be classifying people as W-2s, not as 1099s. M my thought was another one, but it sounds like the panel doesn't see a risk of that happening by, from a legislative point of view, um, more that fintechs addressing the gaps that have been opened up by the fewer number of W-2 jobs. Yeah, so anyway. I mean, um, well, I mean, 
You know, so one of the companies I think Ashley mentioned was Brex, which is a, a corporate credit card for startups. Um, and, uh, you know, they obviously just recently raised money. And, you know, you would think that, you know, <laughs> providing credit to startups, right, who are probably reducing, you know, trying to reduce costs is probably not a great idea. And, you know, I think they did try to mitigate some risk by, um, I, I heard that they were reducing some credit limits on, you know, some of their customers. But, you know, um, I think the concern on, you know, uh, defaults on payments or losses, you know, uh, is, is, is much less than the possibility of growth, right, within their existing customer base. So, you know, I would have thought that would be risky, but, you know, they clearly have, <laughs> have some inside knowledge that, you know, this might be an area of growth and, and got some additional funding. So who knows? <laughs> Is there another question? I do. Yeah, I've got actually a couple of questions rega uh, regarding political crisis, so I'll, I'll ask them both. Um, we are already seeing an uptick in violence in countries such as Brazil. In the past, people have related, have reacted to such upheavals by turning to tangible, barterable things. What happens in the new world and will they turn towards or away from elect electronic payments? That's from Tay Revez. And then from uh, Tiona, what new payments, products, services, if any, do you see emerging due to COVID that will be here to stay? So the first, the first one <clears throat> being about tangible, uh, it just disappeared. Did the panel catch that on the first question? I think we can see it out in the answer, but just to my understanding, okay. is the concern here that in a place with political crises or just lack of infrastructure for payments, you'll be turning away from, from, from payments? Is that, is that really what the question was? Uh, let me know, panelists, if you misunderstood it elsewhere in another way. Um, but if, if that's what it was, then I completely disagree. You have to look at countries that are either um, you know, fast growing and thinking of the, the brick econ uh, economies, those that have rapid growth, not necessarily the best infrastructure. Um, think of India, for example, that has moved a lot of their, their uh, cash completely electronically and they're able to, to lend and, and access credit by, by, um, through this. They're able to uh, manage you know, the entire economy this way. So I don't think it's fair to say, Oh, just because somewhere is in, have, is not in the best political state or has um, not the existing infrastructure, they're going to shy away from payments. It's been done in other countries and it's proven to work. And depending on how you, you use the term um, barter, but certainly there's been a growth of marketplace activity in the U.S. So buyers and sellers who want to make money or, or, or get find goods and services or sell goods and services that weren't readily available. So aside from the 1,000% the growth of puzzle sales on offer up, there are numerous other examples where um, someone couldn't get a mask or, and they're turning to local applications and marketplaces like OfferUp. And so the activity has really skyrocketed. And in terms of the payment aspect, that that's either happening via Venmo or, or um, you know, in-person cash, but the digital payments I think has, has elevated the capability of buying and selling in a situation where you just really need something urgently and you can't go to the grocery store, it's not on the shelf, Amazon won't deliver it for a month. So that's been interesting to see too. And then the um, second question, new products that we think will be here to stay? I'm happy to jump in quickly and just give my thoughts. Um, maybe not just new products that are here to stay, but really the development. Um, and I've talked about this before, you know, consumers want to see their entire financial picture. They want to better manage their finances. Um, so there's definitely going to be a lot of growth and, you know, there's a lot of comments coming in from major investors, uh, FT, QED, talking about, you know, this once in a lifetime opportunity uh, to purchase fintechs and to really develop partner and having all these acquisitions coming in. Um, I definitely see there being this growth of, uh, you know, whole finance, whole, um, what do you call this? 
like full offering products being as resulting at the end, um, starting early. When, when, yeah, once we get out of the lockdown, once people begin having those conversations, you know, that's probably going to be one of the first things that we're going to be noticing. Um, probably on the credit rebuilding, I'd mentioned that in the past, that's probably going to be something that we're going to see growing. Um, and I don't think attitudes are going to change, you know, in, in, the, in the immediate future. So we're still going to see the strengthening and the growing on the e-commerce, on the payment processing and, the, and yeah. Someone made a comment, financial education. Should we answer, do you want to answer that or do you, should we continue this question? Apologies, I, someone said, uh, someone in the chat. Um, Ashley, did you want to just pick up where Camilla left off and then we'll, we'll move over to the second topic? Yeah, I, it was more in terms of other trends or services or products that will gain traction in light of COVID. And one thing that we should definitely make sure to highlight is banks' openness to innovation during this time, right? And as they come to grips with the fact that modern fintechs really can help them provide a better digital experience for their customers, both in the crisis and beyond. With, and I would say the biggest caveat here is that they need to be double ready solutions, right? So if you think about what a bank is going through today or especially a month ago, right? They are facing unprecedented obstacles, trying to distribute liquidity as efficiently as possible, manage increased call center volume. I think call center volume is five times average, especially in the first few weeks of, of April. And, and combating fraud and, and new consumer and S&P processes. And, and the winning players here will be, you know, shovel-ready back-end infrastructure that will help banks combat one or all of these issues. And, you know, we've seen a handful of companies in this space. One of them is, is Prasado, which is actually in our portfolio, which is using AI-based language to help mitigate the collections crisis. And, and, you know, we'll continue to see software providers and technology providers here to stay as banks kind of open up their arms a little bit more willingly as they realize that fintechs can help them battle a lot of these really <laughs> unfounded uh, problems. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think AI is going to be coming more to the forefront uh, amongst fintechs. And then, you know, uh, with the whole uh, coronavirus um, situation, there have been a lot more um, you know, uh, hacking and phishing campaigns, right? Um, there was a company called, I, I want to say it was like Proofpoint had said that there were uh, 300, more than 300 uh, phishing campaigns over the same time last year. And so, you know, and, and people are targeting people for uh, personal information, banking information, you know. Um, and, and so uh, I think um, as we become more digitized, right? We're going to have to have better solutions for these, um, you know, the fraudulent activity and and um, security issues that are going to come around because people are going to say, hey, you know, is my data safe in this mobile app? You know, it, you know, is is this email that I'm getting real, <laughs> right? And and I think the 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 more that we can do to kind of make the consumers feel safe, especially in a time when there's a lot going on, they don't feel safe. Uh, will go a long way. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, digital security, uh, financial security, and um, AI, definitely, you know, big, big areas of growth and, and interest. And if I can maybe add one more point of something that came up, I don't think it's been um, mentioned as much. Uh, so, you know, you, someone mentioned earlier in this panel, the fact that there's, you know, this demand for a lot of consumers, especially in the older demographic. Uh, to be going into branch, to be dealing with um, a personal advisor and, and to, go, to, to walk with them on managing their finances. Uh, and I'm not sure if anyone else saw this, but there was a BCG, Boston Consulting Group study, talking about how only 16% of Americans um, would be like less likely to go to a branch post-COVID, which just shows our reluctancy to change how we, how we manage our finances. And um, it's compared like to countries like the UK, I think it was uh, Hong Kong and Canada. So, you know, countries that, you know, very similar to the United States in, in, in various aspects of, um, of, of its demographic. Now, mind you, what I've noticed, and what, you know, diving a bit deeper into this, um, people still want to be going to branches, right? Because there's a gap 
in this rush to digital uh, financial services, where complex services, you still want to go to, bran to branches. Whether it's a matter of, of, you know, I don't know if my data will get hacked, I don't know, you know, I'm giving a lot of sensitive information. Think of, you know, when you're applying for a mortgage, when you're applying for a life insurance, you don't necessarily just want this to go away so quickly. You want to make sure you're getting all the information so you go into a branch. Um, now, the process, how it's going to be done, is probably going to change in a post-COVID world. So instead of going to a branch to deposit all of my paperwork to get a mortgage, maybe I can do that digitally and it can be processed online. So that, you know, the AI piece, the, the, the having it all digitally and you go into the branch to really having that relationship aspect. Um, so we're just you know, tying it all up now. Yeah, and I think the other example of that in the insurance space is the fact that now you, that you can't send, you know, like claim adjusters into one's home, it's now self-reporting its videos, it's, it's self-reporting through a mobile app. Um, if it's property inspection, sending a drone, so all these sort of digital self-service scenarios that definitely the insurance industry is, is been forced to take a look at and also paperless um, claims processing using AI automation, OCR. Um, so that's definitely, I think it'll be interesting to see if those um, use cases remain because they're seeing customer satisfaction improve and or cost savings, maybe even revenue generation. So that'll be interesting to measure you know, if we have this conversation again, you know, what this looks like in six months, um, which might be interesting. So, um, so I think we're gonna start to wrap up here. We, we have time for one more question. And I did wanna circle back to the financial education question because we kind of skipped over that. So if there was any other um, comments on the financial education piece. Um, I open that up to the panel and then we'll, we'll save time for one more question. Okay, I've got uh, two remaining here. I'm just going to read both so I can clear the board. Uh, the first one is, I think it's more of a comment uh, from Joyce Melman. Uh, Lily Banking is specific to the gig, uh, gig economy, which launched last year. and This has driven a lot of traction to them from new users. They specifically help 1099 and self proprietors with uh, and single person owned LLCs. And then we have a question from um, Jay Fleming. Um, in my opinion, and this is to Julia's point, in my opinion, contactless payments will have to move away from a device card tap with, oh, please sign this, and will do so with uh, an attempt to use uh, branded strategies. So I guess that's more of a comment as well. I'm looking at the mute buttons. Who wants to tackle first question? Oh, maybe you could repeat the question. <laughs> yeah, Bill, yeah. do you want to repeat the first question? Yeah. yeah, those are the tough kind of questions, Ray. By the end of it, you forgot what it was about at the beginning. <laughs> so please, Bill. Yeah, I think, uh, well, the first one was just a, uh, more of a comment. Um, and I hope it's not an ad. Uh, somebody mentioned that Lily Banking um, is specific to the gig economy. And they've gotten a lot of traction with new users. And they're, um, I guess they're specifically targeting 1099s and uh, self proprietors. Sorry, what, what's the question here that we can contribute to, if you don't mind? Yeah, it doesn't really sound like a question to me. So um, I, I think they're probably just highlighting this uh, this banking service that somebody's introduced. You know, yeah, it, so I think it's it, more it, of a comment. It, it, it sounds like on the East Coast, we're getting closer to dinner time. So that's, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I, 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 on the chat, I see a question. I think they just use the chat rather than the question function. Um, and yeah. it's somebody actually that I know, um, we met a few years ago in money 2020. Um, if, if you want me to read it out or do you want me to send it over the question app? It's about the financial education that like you mentioned, Jen. Let's tackle financial education just because I didn't want to skip over that prior questions. If we could um, tackle that and then um, that one final question that I see in the chat. Okay. 
So financial education, what, what do we see coming out of this? Um, what, what's changing? What do we need to do? Where are there opportunities? I mean, the immediate thing that I'm thinking about is in a, you know, pre-COVID, right? Like all last year, we were talking about the fact that the average uh, American didn't even have $400 in their savings in, in a case of an emergency. And I think this stuck true. I heard the same story come out uh, in the United Kingdom. So even these developed countries, um, people just don't have the education to really manage their finances, mm -hmm. to be able to... Um, you know, say, say what are the best financial products for them? They think anyone that has uh, stocks must be a multimillionaire. There's no way that they can begin growing their wealth apart from just having their maybe interest on deposits, right? So I think that there's definitely a financial edu uh, education element that's going to be um, demanded. You know, it started pre-COVID. It's now, I think, time if people are realizing, you know, this came out of nowhere. No one saw a recession coming. This wasn't caused by financial markets. This was definitely something that hit us from left field. So moving forward, you know, the products that I use, I want to be able to better manage my financial picture. So absolutely. I mean, I think it's critical. And, and you have, I mean, the first thing that I thought of when someone mentioned financial education and, um, and I mentioned stocks, I think of Stash, you know, part of their uh, proposition, not only is buying fraction of shares, but through a very simple subscription model, very simple instructions on, you know, why do you, what, why, why bother buying stock? Like, what does it look like? Why, why do you expect, like, why were you expecting returns within a year, five years, 10 years? You know, what does your landscape look like? Here's a retirement fund. There's just, it's so interactive and really helps people get through and understand their, their, their picture, their position. Um, and that's critical moving forward, especially now people have gotten this, this wake up call, if you will, and as, does, as has the industry. Yeah, and I think what's jumped out to me, and I don't know if the panel agrees, that communication is key. So I, I just personally try out all the, the FinTech products I can, and I'm constantly impressed by the level of communication by Acorns, Betterment, for example, versus my own bank. It's incredible how they're just not staying top of mind and saying, okay, we're in a crisis, but here are the things that you should think about. Here are the trends on the market. Here's what's happened over the last, you know, 80 years. Um, and so I'm not saying Acorns only because um, Bain is an investor, but I, I think communication has been really interesting to observe um, on the financial literacy side. I think, Julia, you were going to add something before I jumped in. Yeah, so I, I'm part of the Elevate Network, which is um, geared towards women professionals. And um, I saw this email that came out this week that mentioned that, you know, uh, the majority of small business owners tend to be women. And uh, a lot of them have been severely affected by the pandemic, obviously, for various reasons. And, um, and a lot of them now are trying to, you know, find ways to educate themselves to one, figure out what to do, right, amidst, amongst this pandemic, like what options do they have? And then two, you know, really sort of now that they understand that this is a, is a possibility, you know, educate themselves for the future in terms of like, how do I better set up my business? How do I better budget? How do I better, you know, get the, you know, uh, additional sort of sources of revenue um, built into my operating model so that you know, in the future when bad things happen, you know, I'm not as severely affected. And so uh, I, I do see a lot of people, especially women, thinking about, you know, financial education a lot more now than they might have previously, which I, you know, which I think is great. So yeah, that was, that was all I wanted to add. Yeah, and, and one last comment uh, on this point is that there will be, there has been actually even pre-COVID a wave of people thinking a lot more about your financial wellness. I mean, I'm, I'm personally involved in this organization called Sensibility that teaches lectures to kids in, in areas that may not have, you know, the schooling or the parents or whoever it may be to teach them, you know, what's a 401k and what does saving mean and, and kind of the, the dynamics there. And, and that's one angle to take it uh, or approach this problem through a not-for-profit way. But another way is to leverage you know, the thing that these kids have in their hand every single day, which is their phone, right? <laughs> like, leveraging the app they interact with on a daily basis to create a better, you know, picture of their financial image. And, you know, even the past month or so, I've seen more than a handful of startups who are reached out thinking about, 
you know, how do you manage your, your personal PFM? So what did you spend money on this month? Or how do you think about saving? And these tools, especially if, if we get into a recession, only become more pressing as people, you know, put their economics or, or their financial wellness at the forefront of their attention. And so this will, this trend has been increasing over time and I think will continue to be a, a very prominent trend in the future. And then I guess just to wrap up, I guess there's a, a question in the chat about, it's sort of a good transition, which is you have the financial literacy, but then you also have the challenge of digital literacy. And so I think the question, if I'm not mistaken here, is about um, you know, digitization. Not every consumer you know, has a smartphone. Not every person knows um, how to uh, transact or even understand what is a phishing scheme and what is not. I've answered probably 10 of those questions in the last 48 hours for my parents. Um, so I guess the question here is, you know, there's a huge digital gap. So how do, how do we start addressing that as well on top of the financial literacy gap? Any final thoughts? I mean, there are startups who are trying to combat. There's a company called uh, TrueLink as an example, which helps against elder fraud. And there have been more than a handful of companies in this space as they realize the pain points of, of elder fraud. So as an example, you know, create, I know that this company spins up credit cards that you can implement certain rules on. So as an example, if there's a grandma with Alzheimer's and who likes to donate to a charity, you know, whatever, whatever the charity may be, uh, once a month, but you know, she gets a phone call the first day she donates, the second day she gets a phone call and she thinks she hasn't donated. Mm -hmm. There are ways to put limits on, on your credit card such that they know you could only donate once a month. And so putting in mechanisms through payments and fintech innovation to help prevent elder fraud. That's one great example I've seen. Excellent. Well, I think um, we're out of time. David? Well, I know my wife wants me to go cook because she made part of it and I have to finish off before we can eat. So uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I usually wind up at this point, I go grab another drink and say thank to everyone. And so I'll thank you right now. But the best comment of the night that I can't do better than I got a, I got a Slack message from a friend of mine saying, I'm truly loving this group of smart, badass women, truly fantastic insights. So I can't do better than that. I want to thank you very, very much for taking the time this evening to share all this with me. I hope you have found it enjoyable. I hope those attending have. And if you like it, Naipe, try to do things of this quality every month or two. We're just getting our feet wet in uh, the whole digital space, but I think this worked out reasonably well. And none of it would have been possible without your contributions. So thank you very, very much. And I wish you all the best. Thank you, everyone. Camilla, Ashley, Julia, you were fantastic. And thanks, David, for giving us the, the platform. See you soon. Yeah, Bye. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.